Swanson from Purdue University, who will speak on one of the fantastic joint contributions of Merox and Craig Kuneke. Type closure. <laughs> Thank you all. Um, um, so I will talk about the work of Hoxter and Hunica mostly and how tight closure, how tight closure came about. And uh, this uh, tight closure is really the inspiration for this conference. And I thank Jugo Orma, just like uh, Claudia thanked him. Jugo was really the main force behind this conference and more than year long events in honor of uh, Mel Hoxter and Craig Hunicke. So thank you, Jugo. And we're getting more emails from him for further events and, uh, and um, happenings, yeah. Um, so uh, Craig is probably online and we really appreciate his presence, but, but Mel has not been able to log in. Instead, he is sending us this message and I will read it out loud. Out loud. I would like to thank the organizers and the participants for listening. I count myself lucky to have had so many wonderful collaborators, colleagues, students, and mathematical friends. I wish everyone much joy in their pursuit of mathematics. This is a very Mel statement, and yeah, this is, uh, uh, he has been a great inspiration to most of us here, mathematically and also personally, and this is just another one of those evidences. Um, so, uh, I will, uh, there is so much to tight closure, uh, it's impossible to cover it in 60 minutes. So I will make some um, assumptions, I will not define very much, and most of the things that I'll talk about will be in characteristic P, uh, but just, it will make things simpler. So if I write some statement and I just say R is a ring, it's probably a ring of characteristic P, maybe I won't say it. And that's standard notation there um, in tight closure. You've seen it many times this week, last week, and in your life. Um, so here's the definition of uh, tight closure. Uh, I won't read it out loud. Uh, but why would somebody, so algebra is, we solve equations. That's what we do. But why would somebody make you solve infinitely many equations simultaneously? That's really hard. Well, it turns out that it, this gives a really useful notion. This notion didn't come out of nowhere, as, the, as has been pointed out many times. Uh, the work of Peskin and Spiro in homological conjectures in the 1960s, the proof of Hoxter, Hunic, uh, I'm sorry, Hoxter and Roberts on rings of invariance uh, of re linearly reductive groups acting on polynomial rings, being called Macaulay, that um, also use similar methods. Uh, Hunica's proof of the uh, Ito, Hunica Ito theorem and power, integral closures of powers of ideals also used some methods. And what I learned on Monday from uh, Craig's, Craig Hunica's talk, that there was also a preprint of, uh, never published preprint by Mel Hoxter of deep local rings that also used tight closure type uh, proofs. So this definition, where you have to solve infinitely many equations at the same time, uh, has uh, unify some of those old proofs, but m it does actually a lot more. So that's the whole power um, that it was didn't just write one proof for all those previous theorems, but it also gave really quick, elegant proofs to some of the new theorems. Uh, and then there has been lots of activity forever after. And I will touch on some of those things um, in the next uh, hour. There were several uh, announcements and published statements before this first paper in the uh, Journal of the American Mathematical Society. This one was published in 1990. I studied from the preprint. Uh, it was a thick preprint, not teched. Um, so when this came out, I didn't really have to use it, uh, but that was really a masterpiece, and it still is a masterpiece. I keep using this um, paper for reference for all sorts of things. But what was so beautiful about this 
paper are amazing about this paper. It's not only in, it gave these basic definitions and it gave basic properties of how tight closure behaves if I is containing J, then the tight closure of I is containing the tight closure of J and all that. Um, not only it gave all those basic definitions that whenever it defines something, you have to prove the basic things. And not only it proved, gave really quick proofs of those old results, but it proved so much more. And while it was proving so much more, it developed not just things in tight closure proper, but there were things that never saw tight closure in the statement or don't possibly don't need it in the proof. So I learned a lot of mathematics, not just about tight closure from this preprint. It, it was very rich. And furthermore, when it came, at least when it came in this um, uh, published version, they already had seven pa thick papers lined up ahead of time. I brought one of those thick papers, 80 some pages in um, it's a phantom homology that appeared several la years later. So they already had a map, they already knew uh, what was uh, coming up. Anyway. I had a front seat. I was a student of Craig Hunicke's, and later I was a postdoc with Mel Hoxter. Um, and some of the lessons that I learned from the two of them, and even from the, uh, just their papers, not necessarily from they, their saying so, understand your methods and literature deeply. And that it's worth taking the time to understand the methods really well. It will pay off in the long run. You'll be able to use them somewhere. And then once you understand the method, just play with it for a while. Uh, if you don't play with it, well, then it's just it's that stale thing somewhere in the back of your brain. But play with it. Uh, try to see where else it applies. And then, um, and then apply it somewhere else when you can. And then, again, the power of this is that it applies, these methods apply not just in tight closure proper. And you know, such theory doesn't happen all that uh, often. Uh, okay. So the first result is that if R is a regular, room, uh, regular ring, then for all ideals I, uh, the, the tight closure of I is the same as I. So for this, the, what you need to know is that the Frobenius functor is faithfully flat on regular rings of characteristic P, of course. Everything is characteristic P. So in particular, that element C um, is in the uh, uh, Frobenius power of i colon the corresponding power of x. So that's in i colon x, uh, Frobenius power of that i colon x. And if uh, you take higher and higher Frobenius powers of i colon x, well, there aren't very many c's like that in the regular ring. The only possible c is 0. But c is not supposed to be in any minimal prime. So then uh, I colon X, if it uh, cannot be a proper ideal. So I colon X, uh, so whatever is in the tight closure of I has to be in the ideal. All right. Um, so next result, so this is already a beautiful result. And maybe I should say, oh, I even say, rings in which all ideals are tightly closed, as everybody in this room knows, are called um, F regular. Or, sorry, weekly F regular. <laughs> the next <coughs> result, this one was not uh, in the uh, mountain of theorems that uh, the tight closure simplified to. This was a new result that was getting proved with tight closure. Sorry, with an L generated ideal, or maybe it doesn't have to be L generated, but it must have an L generated reduction, which we hope L is strictly smaller than the number of generators of I. Then for all non-negative integers n, the integral closure of uh, the n plus lth power of i is contained in the tight closure of n plus first power of i. Okay. So um, if we start with a regular ring, then you can forget that tight closure there. And uh, so that is, generalizes the brienz skoda theorem from um, the rings of convergence power, power series that was done earlier. Here's a Hoxter's question. And this is one of the beauties that uh, interplay between elementary basic algebra and tight closure. Uh, can you, uh, so here's a fact. You start with a polynomial ring in two variables. So that's a regular ring. And uh, start with three elements, arbitrary elements, f, g, and h. 
and let i be the ideal generated by f uh, cubed, g cubed, z cubed. That's a three-generated ideal. Um, but in a, uh, in a polynomial ring, uh, we may not, this ideal may not have a two-generated reduction, but at least locally it will have a two-generated reduction. So if we can prove that inclusion that fgh raised to the second power is in this ideal locally, then we'll be done. So it suffices to prove that inclusion locally, and locally L is equal to 2. And, um, and then if we take N is equal to 0, and uh, then we have the, oh, and we also need to know that F times G times H is integral over I. So the square of FGH is uh, in the integral closure of I squared. Okay. So this is an element, yes? Uh, oh, oh, sorry, that, excuse me, Z is supposed to be H. I'm sorry. I saw, I read this many times. Okay. Uh, yeah, Z equals H. Um, so, so quite, Hoxter's question is, uh, can you find a, a, an elementary proof of this fact? So if you, for any FGH, surely you can do that. But can you give an elementary fact without using tight closure methods of this uh, inclusion for an arbitrary FGH in the ring? Okay, so I won't teach you anything new today, so, but maybe by the end of the hour you can have a proof of this. Okay, another big thing that they proved with tight closure is colon capturing. So uh, not every system of parameters is a regular sequence, but if you are in a pretty good ring, so module finite over a regular domain, and uh, if you start with elements that actually are in the base ring, but in the bigger ring they form a system of parameters or part, part of the system of parameters, then uh, the colon of n minus one of them with the nth one well, it may not be contained in the, the original ideal of n minus one elements, but it will be in the tight closure. So that, so uh, at least if you know that you're in a, a weakly F regular rings, then you can forget the tight closure, uh, but in general you can't. And then here's another version of colon capture. Again, you have um, a base ring A that's regular, and R is module finite over it, but in addition also torsion free. Um, and if you start with ideals in the ring, they don't have to have anything to do with parameter ideals, but if you do any kind of colining or intersecting with the extended ideals in R, well, it suffices, just do your colons or intersections down in the base ring and then extend. So that makes it quite a bit simpler. These are not the two most general statements that we can make um, about uh, colon capturing, they're much more general statements, but uh, suffice it to say over here. And this has some strong consequences. Um, so monomial conjecture is the easiest one that, uh, so if we start with the system of parameters of R, then um, uh, we want to show that the teeth power of a product of all those, the system of parameters, is not in the ideal generated by t plus first powers of the parameters themselves. So you might as well go to completion uh, to prove that, and you might as well go mod a minimal prime, so then we are in a, um, uh, the theory in local ring uh, that's complete and domain, and if you need, oh, maybe we should have passed to an infinite residue field at some point as well, um, or, but then you just take a, a a regular subring that can, that's generated over the base field, or sorry, over the coefficient field by x1 through xd. And then there, that colon ideal, um, so there the inclusion definitely doesn't happen, and therefore it cannot happen by the colon capturing in the bigger uh, ring. So monomial conjecture is very easy to prove once you have colon capturing, and it's well known that the direct sum and conjecture is equivalent to the monomial conjecture, so we won't prove that. So there are these easy proofs um, with tight closure. I repeated the monomial conjecture and direct sum and conjecture, 
And, um, and then one of the consequences here, uh, so this is uh, the Huckster-Roberts proof that the rings of invariance of linearly reductive groups acting on polynomial rings, I call Macaulay, they, uh, that proof, uh, and also that's the direct sum, that proof use these basic tight closure methods. And um, so uh, what you can prove very easily with tight closure, the direct summons of regular F regular F regular or weakly F regular rings have the same property, and then all such rings are called Macaulay, so that gives the uh, Huckster Roberts uh, ring, uh, direct uh, rings of invariance are called Macaulay. Um, then um, I probably shouldn't read all these. There are lots of vanishing theorems. This vanishing theorem that I wrote here and I will not read is um, already appeared in the that amazing paper, um, but just sometimes you can guarantee ahead of time that certain Tor maps are zero. The modules themselves need not be zero, but the maps are zero. Okay. And this vanishing of Tor, this theorem in particular, can al it also implies the direct sum and conjecture. There are much more general vanishing theorems proved with tight closure and uh, subsequently. And uh, then there's the phantom intersection theorem um, that uh, is also touched on here. I will, um, so the original theorem by Paul Roberts that was proved is if you start with, um, with a complex of free, uh, uh, of finitely generated free modules, and you know that all the homologies have finite length and the zeroth homology is not zero, then the, uh, Paul Roberts proved that the dimension of the ring is less than or equal to the length of this complex. And um, so that can also be proved with tight closure, and we'll see later with tight closure, you can even do more of these um, intersection and general, uh, new and improved uh, vanish, uh, in intersection theorem. All right. More that they did in that first paper, improvement of the syzygy theorem of Evans and Griffith. Uh, so let R be an Ethereum a local ring of characteristic P. Let M be a finitely generated K syzygy theorem of finite projected dimension. And let X be a minimal generator of M. Then the depth of the order ideal of this element X, so that's the, the images of, uh, in R of all the, um, of X under all the possible homomorphisms from M into R. So the depth of that order ideal is at least K. The original theorem of Evans and Griffith uh, had proved that the height of that order ideal is at least k, but um, with tight closure that they prove more that even the Cohen Macaulay, uh, the depth is at least k. And uh, one of the consequences of this is that any submodule of this m, th of m uh, that's generated by uh, up to k minimal generator, so m has some minimal. Uh, minimal generators, take a set of minimal generators, and if you choose a subset of up to k of them, that degenerates, um, that is a free submodule. Okay. Uh, and in this, not quite this form, in some of this, that form, what I just said was already proved by, by Auslander and Bridger and by Bruns and Feder, but not in the great generality that Huxton and Kunica did. Actually, this, uh, Syzygy theorem of Evans and Griffith was proved by Hoxter and Hunecke, um, not by, uh, well, by tight closure, but something they called Cohen Macaulay tight closure. So in their papers, they introduce more than just the tight closure proper, but there are various other notions, and I will not give their definitions. So Cohen Macaulay tight closure is one in particular that was used for the proof of the Syzygy theorem. Uh, and then there's also tight closure with respect to family ideals. The original family is just the set of all principal ideals generated by elements not in any minimal prime, uh, but you can take more general families. Then uh, one thing I did not define and I'm not planning to defining is uh, tight closure of modules in characteristic P or otherwise. And uh, for modules, you don't necessarily need to assume that modules are uh, finitely generated. So in that case, you might need some kind of um, approximated, approximation. So finitistic, you, you can do the regular tight closure definition, but you may want to bring it down to something that uses finitely generated modules. So that was 
finitistic tight closure or also absolute tight closure. Um, and then another thing that I will not talk about is tight closure in characteristic zero. Uh, we need some, um, there's a lot of machinery that goes into this and uh, it's, so one other thing is maybe you don't necessarily care about tight closure in characteristic P or characteristic zero, but the machinery that brings tight, uh, tight closure questions from characteristic zero to characteristic P is worthwhile learning. Uh, there's a lot of really amazing tricks that help you understand what is really going on and reduce the questions into the bare bones. What is going on? Just like what uh, Craig Hunica was saying in his talk on Monday. Um, this is typical Mel, but also typical Craig. Reduce your question is, what is the true question? What is the gist of it? And so what does it mean to be in the tight closure? Collect the data, translate it somewhere. See how you can play with it there. Okay. Um, and, um, and then the other thing that comes up in the, the other thing I want to say about tight closure and characteristic zero, uh, there are two possible definitions of uh, uh, reducing from characteristic zero to characteristic P. One is where C's just appear when you are in various mod P's, and one is where you're also collecting information about C. Those two definitions of tight closure turn out to be the same, but that brings into the uniform uh, notion. So one thing that tight closure really forced us to force us or enabled us to do is to think about uniform results. Can you use one, te uh, one C in the definition for more than one ideal, for infinitely many ideals? And I'll talk more about that in a little bit. Uh, but there are uh, a few more other um, closure operations that uh, were happening at the same time. Hoxter was developing the theory of solid closure in any characteristic. Um, that was a, it was a hope that solid closure would be equal to tight closure and then you could prove things in equal characteristic rings, but it pretty soon it came up that no, uh, they're not the same. Um, and then uh, Hoxter with his student Juan Vélez was doing diamond closure and Adela Vracho, another student of Hoxter, was doing special tight closure. And there were other closure operations and, um, okay. And then Neil Epstein developed many closures uh, in very abstract way. All right. Oh, oh, there's also integral closure, regular closure, plus closure. Yeah, uh, they're all interrelated. Um, that's right. Regular cl closure also appears in uh, Hoxter and Hunica, even I think, even in this, maybe in this one of these two. The white one. All right. Thank you. Uh, Plus closure, Karen Smith did a lot of work on plus closure. That's another beautiful theory that came out of tight closure with okay, that's test elements. All right. So in the original definition of uh, elements of uh, tight closure of an ideal, for every element x that's in the tight closure, you need to come up with that test element c that makes c times x to the q be in the appropriate Frobenius power of i. Uh, but can we find C that works for every ideal and for every X in the tight closure? Um, well, that sounds really nice, right? Um, there is no such thing, uh, um, there's no such notion of test elements for uh, integral closure. So for integral closure, it is also true that an element X is in the integral closure of I if and only if there exists C away from minimal primes such that c times x to the n is in the nth power of the ideal. And that's very easy to prove with um, evaluation theory, for example. But um, there's no one c that would work for all ideals i and all x. Uh, uh, so I will say more about that. Maybe it doesn't work for ideals, but then they're asymptotic if you are willing to change powers. That's different. But it turns out that these test elements for tight closure do exist under some fairly mild assumptions on the ring. And um, let's see, the, yeah. oh, um, before I get there. Um, so in the proofs 
of existence of test elements. That's another rich um, part of mathematics that uh, Hoxton and Hunecke wrote up so beautifully. Again, even if you don't care about tight closure, the existence of test elements, well, maybe they're technical, but there's so much to learn there. There's, you'll have to learn about excellent rings and lippmann satay theorem and generic smoothness and powers of discrete valuations, amazing things that they do, what trace can do. There are all these things that come into play, um, and there are many different um, proofs of this test elements because there are different assumptions uh, and then if different existence theorems for these test elements. But one of the consequences of test elements is the persistence of tight closure under ring homomorphisms. So already early in the theory of tight closure, you can prove that um, tight closure uh, um, uh, respects inclusions of ideals, that tight closure of tight closure is the same as tight closure. It has all those properties that uh, you, expect, you expect of a closure operation that's a, that are really easy to prove. But it is not easy to prove that um, if x is in the tight closure of an ideal i in the ring r and you pass to an algebra, that x is still in the tight closure of the extended ideal. So what you do need is something like a test element and some other clever tricks that, again, are really good uh, ring theory, whether you want to do t uh, into, uh, tight closure or not. And so when you do those tricks with, uh, you get that, oh yeah, um, uh, uh, elements of the tight closure in the ring stay in the tight closure of, uh, of an extended ring. All right. Now, phantom homology and phantom acyclicity criterion. Um, so uh, I assume here that most of you, or maybe all of you, have seen the Boltzmann Eisenbad criterion for exactness. Um, so this is, uh, uh, I will comment on that. Suppose that R is a homomorphic image of a co macaulay ring and is locally equidimensional. And then we start with a G, a finite free complex, so a finite complex of finitely generated free modules. And the, the, this complex satisfies the standard rank and height conditions after tensoring with R mod the nil radical. Okay, so uh, standard rank and height conditions. So uh, rank of a, mat uh, of a matrix, uh, of a map, is um, what is the large, at least if in, we are in the domain, simplistic one, uh, rank of a matrix is the largest integer such that the, the the t uh, largest integer t such that t by t minors of that matrix don't vanish. Okay, so that's over domain. So, uh, and then you want the, the rank of a module to be equal to the rank of nullity of the next one minus uh, uh, the rank of the previous map. So, uh, so suppose you have, um, well, we, we have these standard rank and height conditions in Bosbaum Eisenbad, you instead assume standard rank and depth conditions, which is stronger than height conditions. Um, and then the conclusion here with the weaker hypothesis uh, uh, is that all uh, higher cycles of the Frobenius power of this complex are in the tight closure of the boundaries um, uh, in this cycle. So in other words, that's the terminology homologies of all Frobenius powers of this complex are phantom. Uh, Boltzmann Eisenbad uh, concludes that the homologies are all zero, but here uh, it, with tight closure, it's, well, it's zero up to tight closure. Yeah. Um, so this is a pretty powerful re result, and this uh, first result is so for each one of the elements in each of the cycles, you want to prove that it's in the tight closure of the boundary, so you need the C for each one of those elements. But with a few more assumptions on the ring, you can even get this uh, phantom acyclicity with the denominator, as they call, where you find one C that annihilates all of these homologies. You do need some conditions, um, and. Uh, but again, it's beautiful commutative algebra de developing those. Um, 
And uh, so uh, Ian Aberbach developed the phantom homology and uh, modules of um, finite uh, phantom projected dimension to make it into a theory that kind of resembles the uh, theory of fi uh, uh, projected dimensions, uh, of modules of finite projected dimension. I think I've turned the page. Okay. Um, so then there are more notions related to tight closure. And um, so uh, cone McCauliffier. So this is like in this phantom uh, homology, uh, things are, um, homology is zero up to tight closure, but maybe these cone McCauliffiers make them zero. Um, and uh, if, if you multiply by sufficiently high power, or maybe there's a uniform power, or uh, that makes the, that converts the height condition into a depth condition, so it converts the height into depth, and then you end up with exact complexes. So that's a powerful notion, too, too of coma qualifiers. Um, then, uh, why is that on the same line? Um, well, I guess it was used there, too. R plus, so R plus, uh, so we started with the domain uh, and uh, Noetherian uh, local domain characteristic P, and we take the integral closure of R in the algebraic closure of its field of fractions. So that is called R plus. It's a hugely non-Noetherian ring, um, and uh, uh, I see, uh, yeah, I need, uh, I need to start with an ex uh, excellent or, or maybe a complete local domain. So uh, R plus is a Beacon Macaulay algebra, so lots of good things are happening. And I already mentioned there before, if you, uh, uh, if you start with an arbitrary ideal I in your ring, extend it to R plus and then con contract, that's called the plus closure of the ideal. And it's always true that the plus co closure is contained in the tight closure, but, um, and then there was, um, Karen Smith did a lot more with plus, plus closure and proved equality in many other, connection, uh, many other connections between plus closure and tight closure. Um, then uh, these test elements and cohen qualifiers played also a large role in the uniform properties. So um, Craig, Kuhnke uh, wrote the, the paper, a very influential paper, Uniform Ardent-Reiss Lemma, uh, Ardent-Reiss Theorem, uh, in which he developed a huge amount of theories. Um, so uh, it, it, in a pretty good, not such, uh, uh, it, under mild assumptions, characteristic zero, characteristic P, um, if you take, there exists a K, such that for all ideals i and all powers n, the integral closure of i to the n is contained in the n minus kth power of the, I, uh, of the ideal i. So that was a huge thing. Earlier I said that there is no um, test element for integral closure, but here what we have is, all right, so it's not that c or one multiplies the integral closure of i to the n, into i to the n, it multiplies it into, or c being one, multiplies it into the lower power of the ideal. Um, that was uh, pretty amazing. Uh, what else? Um, in the same paper, there were other results, and I guess I'll, um, uh, oh, and uniform art and Reese, that's the whole title of the paper, uniform art and Reese results. So uh, if you take two finitely generated modules m and n, then for all ideals i, um, uh, there exists a case such that for all ideals i, i to the n times m intersected with n is in i to the n minus k times the, mo uh, the module n. So that was also an extremely powerful result. And there are many people who worked on um, then Art and Reese-like uh, or uniform type properties. Um, and. Uh, Hunica did a lot of that. Uh, Ian Aberbach, um, I don't know why I didn't write, and I'm a little blanking out right now. Um, what else? 
is um, who else was proved. And I forgot to say uh, who else worked on uh, Briens and Skoda theorem, because there are now e uniform versions of the Briens and Skoda theorem as well. There are many people who worked on that, um, and I don't want to forget anybody. Why didn't I say that? I didn't. What is it? Where? Uh, I'm blanking out. No. Well, we'll, well, there will be a test at the end of this uh, um, uh, lecture. And then, um, what's the next thing on my list? Uh, so, huge amount of singularity theory also arose out of tight closure. There have been several talks earlier today and previous days. Um, so, singularity theory, we're talking about F rational, F regular, F pure, F injective, lots of these notions. Um, and some of these notions correspond to the uh, geometric notions in characteristic zero. Um, uh, lots of work here was uh, Smith, Smith, Hara, Karen Smith, Hara, Nobuhara, Mehta, Srinivas. Um, so rational log terminal singularities. And there are these analogies going back and forth. Smith and Hara did a lot of work also on ge geometric interpretation of test ideals. OK. And then another huge part of that got boosted by tight closure and uh, Hilbert Kuhn's functions, they started before tight closure. But they, I think they got uh, second wind uh, or uh, more with um, after tight closure. Uh, was, and we already saw some talks. Same for Hilbert Kuhn's multiplicity. Um, so, uh, and I, we already heard about it today. Monsky did a lot of work. Uh, and then Holger Brenner uh, did a lot more work. And then also, the I should mention at this point, Holger Brenner and uh, uh, Paul Monsky, they prove that tight closure does not commute with localization. So this is one of the basic properties that uh, you would hope that tight closure does commute with localization, but no, it doesn't. Okay. But fortunately, it doesn't destroy theory. It's, the theory is still extremely powerful, even if that basic property doesn't hold. Okay. And then uh, F signature and F threshold, we already heard more about that earlier today. So I'm finishing a little early. I don't think I have any more. No, I'm finishing a little early, but here's a test uh, quiz. Uh, I couldn't possibly do uh, cover all the things that are in tight closure that tight closure influenced. And this was definitely influenced by my um, preferences and what I know. But this, the quiz is, please chime in. What should I mention or what would you mention if you were giving this talk? Craig probably has a lot of things, but I want to hear from this audience first. <laughs> Holger? I mean, for me, for me personally, this notion of solid closure was uh, the, the true starting point. So I, so the the many p to the power e, <laughs> that was a bit too much for me. And for me, solid closure seems more conceptually. And, and for me, that was the starting point. Okay. Which, so that is a, a great paper of Hoxter, I think, even if it doesn't work in uh, equal characteristic exactly. I mean, in positive characteristic, it gives really uh, a nice interpret and surprising interpretation of tight closure by local cohomology like uh, local cohomology behaves when you add an, an element to the ideal in the sense of forcing algebra. So for me, that was a very important point. So I, in fact, so I could uh, go around so, some of the really tight closure stuff. <laughs> <laughs> I see. Good. Thank you. Somebody else? Ian, you were a front seat driver too, so <laughs> <laughs> I'm putting you in the spot.
Well, yeah, I was definitely near the beginning of this. I got to pick low-hanging fruit. It was nice. Um, I, I've been trying to think of something else because what I'm going to say is I feel like I'm just tooting my own horn. I, I think that, the, uh, for instance, the Brienne and Skoda theater, theorem, which uh, looked like, in some sense, it was mostly about regular rings. Then Craig and I were able to prove it for, for F-rational rings in generality. Mm -hmm. um, I, I felt very good about that. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, there had been results about rational singularities, but they mostly applied to, to ideals generated by parameters. Um, and I guess I'd add also um, something that Craig really originated was this idea of the, the um, Branson-Skoda theorems with coefficients right. that, that led to, for instance, um, led to early proofs uh, that over regular rings, the gra associated graded being cone Macaulay, um, and gave it gave the Reese ring being Cohen Macaulay, I think. So those reduction basically that the reduction numbers, the local reduction numbers, had to be small. Mm -hmm. I think in the regular case that so Lipman eventually solved without tight closure. But I, I think that he only solved it because Craig opened the door okay. for that. Yeah, so this uh, tight, uh, Brins and Skoda theorem with coefficients, this again has to do with interclosures of powers being contained in tight closures of ordinary, uh, tight closure powers or ordinary powers times some ideal coefficient. And so this, anytime I saw the theory of evolution of Eisenbahn and Mazer, I, I thought of this tight, uh, Brins and Skoda theorem with coefficients, but in a different way, vein, yeah. Yeah, maybe near you. I would say that tight closure theory always sort of carried a lot of dramatic tension and excitement. Um, so like there was always, that there were all these questions of like, okay, so you've got tight closure, can you, can, can you um, characterize it in some other way? And so like for instance with the, you know, Karen Smith's amazing theorem that it's, that well for parameter ideals it's plus closure. Well, is it plus closure in general? dot, 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 and then, you know, many years later, of course, you know, Holger and, you know, and uh, Paul Monsky showed that it couldn't be because that, you know, because that, it doesn't compete with localization in, in general, and plus closure does. And, but then there were all these other uh, operations, that, and I, you mentioned some of them, and, but the thing is that a lot of them kind of are tight closure, but they're just, diff, uh, at least in, you know, over complete local domains, like, the, you know, the diamond clo closure, if you do it in characteristic P, and the, the um, uh, or, or, or are really close to tight closure. So it sort of created this, this, um, this way of thinking about about the framework of closure operations as as kind of a, a thing in itself, and then people were keep kept hoping to do this in mixed characteristic. And I guess maybe people kind of are by now because these um, uh, yeah perfectoid techniques. But uh, um, you know, I mean, I, I it, so you were saying that like okay, you learn tight closure theory, it's going to help you have a lot of techniques to do other things, and that's true. But I think it also, you know, always provided uh, a lot of um, inspiration to, to try things, mm -hmm. so, which is, you know, also really, really valuable. Thank you. That's <laughs> Oh, yeah. Welcome. <laughs> So, so one of the really nice theorems, which you have not listed, but it was mentioned in the week from, by somebody, is the relation of the symbolic powers and the ordinary powers. Mm -hmm. I think this is really a very astonishing theorem, and it's, I mean, there are proofs in other settings by, by um, Ayn, Smith, and Lassersfeld, but so the much more general statement by, by Unique and Hoxter about the uniform bound uh, that is also one of my favorites, I have to say. Mm -hmm. So that should definitely be on the list. Okay. And Alexander had a question. Okay, 
So I, I want to use this as a, also a way to say thanks to the organizers for both the, sum, the school from last year and also this. What I'm about to say, I didn't know until I had uh, the lectures from um, Ian last year when we were talking about this uniform parents on school. At some point you said that uh, there was applications to the Comecoli property of Risalgebras. algebras. So in 1996, there was this two results, one from Johnson and Ulrich and one from Goto Nakamura and Nishida that were finding sufficient conditions for the Risalgebra algebra to be going Macaulay. And the one from Johnson Ulrich, I'm very familiar with, it uses residual intersections. They use different techniques instead uh, based on this local reduction number that come ultimately from this study of uniform on SCODA and uh, rely on, on this type of closure theory. And I didn't know about it until Ian talked about it last year. And so the best outcome for me personally was going back to that paper and reading and understanding the last piece of my thesis that I was missing. So thank <laughs> you. Any? Thank you. Any other comments? Or? <laughs> I mean, we still have we still have time. So I mean, regarding so it's more, maybe more a philosophical remark. I mean, regarding the uniformity. So my experience in my life <laughs> is rather that um, there are also many cases where you do not have uniformity, and um, so. Tight closure itself, they are really infinitely many equations, and uh, you cannot really reduce it to finitely many equations. Mm -hmm. So that's, uh, in that case, you do not really have uniformity. So mm -hmm. that, I think that was the hope somehow, that you would have here a more uniform mm -hmm. behavior. Mm -hmm. But I think the generic case, as soon as the ring and the ideal gets, um, yeah, more is more on a difficult side of the of the mm. spectrum of the rings mm. we 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 have then you will not have that uh, uniform behavior so i think in general you will really need a good reason for uniformity so don't expect too much uniformity mm. in your life yeah yeah <laughs> yeah so uh, i didn't realize i would finish so early i was skipping a few things one of the things i was going to ask is um so in light of the Ananyan and Hoxter's uh, proof of the Stillman, uh, or counterexample to the, no, sorry, proof of the Stillman conjecture, uh, is there some bound, so if you're in a polynomial ring, uh, mod an ideal, and you want to understand if x is in the tight closure by, and maybe you even know uh, your test element c, it works for all of them. So you know c, so all you're looking for is is c times x to the q contained in iq. So you, there are infinitely many equations, but maybe you can solve this equation for the first 17 q's, but then is there some pattern? Is there some uniformity? Or is there some bound on the degrees of the coefficients that you can take in front of your generator? So you're given x and the generators of the ideal can you bound in some way in, in the sense of Greta Hermann or uh, Abraham, Abraham uh, Seidenberg, the degrees of the coefficients? Mm. So I, that's wide open as far as I know. Any other, what else would you have done? No, okay. Craig Hello. probably has some thoughts. Craig, are you there? I'm here. Yeah, Michael. I can say all yeah. things. Yeah. Yeah. We'll see you. That's fine. Um, oh, well, I do. First, of all, thank you uh, for this uh, very nice talk, and I wanted to thank the organizers one more time. Um, they put in a tremendous amount of work, Jubal in particular, to organize this, and I really appreciate it. I'm sorry I'm not there. I've been enjoying all the talks and I, I'm glad they're on video because I'm able to see the ones I miss because it's in the middle of the night for me for a lot of the morning talks. Um, the one, well, let me say a couple things. When Mel and I, you know, first started Tight Closure, that was certainly one of the most exciting times in my own life. And it's, 
it's very good to be lucky in math, I think. It helps a lot. But it also, uh, to me, there's so much other work that uh, pipe closure connected to um, the F split school, which of course Srinivas is here and knows very well, the multiplier ideals in algebraic geometry. And in a sense, you're lucky that it connected, but the lesson for me is if you follow problems which are interesting and develop things which will help you solve them, it almost surely in mathematics will connect to other things. And the timing just happened to be right for tight closure. But um, as much as I appreciate the retrospective, it, math is all about moving forward. And um, I'm very gratified to see all the beautiful work being done on many different things that uh, the speakers have done in this in the conference. And in, in many cases, tight closure has, has uh, disappeared from what's going on and is maybe only a faint noise in the background, but that's the way it should be. That's, that's what you want as, as math moves forward. One problem that I would always wanted to solve using tight closure is already known. It's a beautiful theorem of, of Dale Kukowski's about characterizing rational singularities by the square of, of um, integrally closed ideals being integrally closed. And I was always sure there should be a uh, tight closure proof of this. I've never been able to find it, but I always felt if you could find it, you would learn something new. And uh, that's something I've always uh, personally wanted to do. And of course, the many problems still remaining about localization at one element or weak implies um, F regularity or strong F regularity is very much an area of a lot of interesting problems, I think, which come up. And I think Ian's speaking about that tomorrow, partly. So thank you again. It's, uh, it's been great. So I can take any questions if there are any for me personally. But. Thank you, Craig. And there. Is that Dale? Yeah, I'm there. Yeah, I was very, I, yeah. I, yeah. Good to, see, it's on, yeah. good to see you, Craig. <laughs> <laughs> it's good to see all of you. Even though I can't, I can't literally see you. Oh, there you are. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. What would you have said about tight closure? Um, you know, somehow I've, I've missed out on this. <laughs> except for uh, just one vague comment that... Um, uh, it looks a lot like almost mathematics. That's, I mean, this whole thing about the test elements and then going to the plus closure and all of this. I mean, it, it, it's, I remember uh, the last MSRI that Paul Roberts was really excited about this, uh, this paper by um, Faultings where he had started this. And, and I'm, I have no idea how he saw that this was the thing which would lead into the proof of the direct sum and conjecture, but somehow, somehow he did. He knew that was, that was what was necessary. <laughs> That's right. Well, Heitman, of course, had just done his... Uh, right, three work. dimensions, yeah, which is fantastic, of course, yeah. yeah. And which is also very much... Mm. Actually, it's one of the great regrets of my life, in a sense, of, that a time constraint. I was asked to uh, sort of go over the manuscript of, of Gabber and Ramirez on almost mathematics. And yeah. I, I would have gotten in on the ground floor, so to speak, but I was so busy, I turned it down. Yeah. That was a real mistake on my part, actually. <laughs> you, probably, probably wouldn't have, you probably wouldn't have had time to do anything else if you <laughs> undertook yeah, that. Yeah, that, that was the problem. <laughs> yeah. We're going to enter into that. You had to commit a huge amount of time. It's always a question in math, you know, for everybody in the audience, you know this very well, that when you see a problem that you're interested in, there's always a question of whether it's worth the time commitment to do it. And you have to make choices and judgments about what the most valuable thing is and what you can expect to get out of it. So I know that's a, something every mathematician has to do. Yeah, in, in general, for... Um 
mathematicians and artists also, uh, especially for more senior ones, there's always this trade-off is whether you should try to get into the latest, latest hot thing that's happening or continue to develop what you've been doing. And it's, it's a hard trade-off. It's very hard, I think. I always, I, I always tried to do a lot of different things, but it, it meant I couldn't go into as much depth sometimes as, as I should have. But it's a trade-off, as you say. I just want to comment that I found that uh, conversation between Dale and, and Craig very interesting, but uh, I want to emphasize uh, maybe um, a point that, that uh, there's many ways to have fun in math and, 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 and have a, a, a decent career in math, and you can try to go deep in one topic or you can go broad uh, in different things, and I think it's, 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 it's a big ten, so uh, you can choose what that is, is suitable for your personalities. I think that's... Um, and the community of algebra is actually one of the um, uh, good area for that because people are very friendly and and very tolerant of different styles. I think that's. I think that's very true. And you you have to understand who you are, as you say it. That's Do right. Do things that are comfortable for you, and you have yeah. fun doing. That's right. You have yeah. to. Yeah. yeah. Do it the way you you want to do it. Yeah, I agree totally. Yeah. Okay. Uh, uh, Craig, I've really enjoyed all your uh, comments that you've been making this meeting, and I see that you're becoming a very sage-like, uh, like a person, like a, like. A <laughs> <laughs> Nobody ever called me sage-like before, so I'll, I'll, I'll put that on a little plaque. I think. <laughs> Thank you. Getting old has some advantages, I guess. Not many. <laughs> But I am really gratified to see all the young people in our field, and they're doing so many wonderful things. That, that um, it's just a joy for the people in the audience, of which there are many who are sort of my age. Uh, if you think back of what community of algebra was like 50 years ago, I mean, it's just had tremendous explosion of ideas and beautiful theorems, and I expect the next 50 years to bring even more things like that. So unfortunately, I won't be alive uh, to see them all, but I can, I get this almost tingly sense when I see things sometimes about, oh, there's a lot more there to do. And it, it's a good feeling. Thank you very much, Craig, and thank you, Irena. <laughs> <laughs>